from the Hagee Ministry Studio in San Antonio, Texas, join us for The Difference with author and leadership strategist Eric Van Alstyne as we explore the power of perception. The average amount of drama for the average worker in America, get this, two hours and 26 minutes a day of drama. That's why seven out of 10 people are looking for a different job. Seven out of 10 people want to think about quitting their jobs every single day. How would you like to cut the drama at home and in the workplace? I'm all in for this one. So on today's show, we're gonna talk about emotional intelligence with Eric Van Alstyne and how to live a better life now. You know, a lot of people would love to cut the drama, but they don't realize the role that they play in doing it. We recently asked some folks in some man on the street moments what they had to say about the subject. <laughs> Emotional intelligence. Let me think. Wow, that's a great question. I'm not a girl, I'm a guy. So I'm gonna get in trouble just for saying that. Um knowing how to deal with your emotion and hopefully emotional intelligence is doing that mm. dealing with your emotion intelligently <laughs> I, like I would think emotional intelligence would speak more to your ability to control your emotions intelligently uh, to be able to respond to a situation with discipline with clarity and with wisdom as opposed to allowing your emotions to run rampant ability to work with people but more importantly to know what's going on inside of you What's in your cookie jar? Intelligence based on your emotions. I think when you're like like a like a, like in high school or in first grade. I I mean emotions are yeah, what you feel, I guess. Emojis. I know. But maybe just being able to know when to know your when to when to feel the emotions that you have? Yeah. Okay, so I agree with the little kid at the light pole that said uh, no and yeah. yes. I mean, yeah. he, he, he at least was, you know, <laughs> certain in his, in, in his answers. <laughs> uh, to me, when we're discussing the emotional quotient versus the perception, is perception is the what, mm. what I see. Emotion is the why. Mm. Why do I see it that way? Mm. You, know, uh, you and I one time had a conversation about uh, Steve Irwin, the, yes. the, the great croc hunter. Yes, And, yes, and, and his perception yep. of reptiles. Yes. You know, what other people saw as dangerous, he yes. would pick up and call oh, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, why did he love snakes? Yeah, yeah, I mean, he'd see an 11-foot python going across the road yeah. and thought it needed to be petted <laughs> instead of turned into <laughs> boots. But, you know, the, the yeah. thing about it is the why for him was different than everybody's what. Mm -hmm. Everybody saw the same what. They mm -hmm. saw a crocodile. They mm -hmm. saw a snake. They saw a mm -hmm. scorpion. Mm -hmm. He saw something that was valued and, and beautiful as opposed to what we saw as dangerous. Right. And so his emotional quotient had a different why. Mm. A and mm. one of the things that you've touched on in perceptual intelligence and, and how people process is why they feel what they feel. That's a big huge. conversation. That is huge because we, you know, we typically have the emotions but we don't know where it got started. It's like a kid pulling a fire alarm in a grade school, right? The alarm is going off, the kids are streaming out of class, and, yeah. but who pulled that alarm? We don't even know what, how that happened. So we are so quickly telling ourselves what this is and what it means and all those things, and then the emotions, though, remain. So we've got all this emotion and we're not, necess we're not necessarily aware of why that is. Now, emotional intelligence as a definition is basically understanding your emotions, emotions and when you're having them too. That's another thing. You can understand what emotions are, but knowing that it's like saying, I don't have a tone and everyone's else saying, yeah, yeah you, do. you do, you have yeah. a tone, right? I'm not yelling. I'm not yelling, you're right. So, or someone saying you're yelling when you're not, right? So it might, it's all these sense of what is actually happening emotionally in me? What's happening emotionally in others? And emotional intelligence is great about that, those first two pillars, 
but not necessarily very good at managing emotions, which is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And what they typically don't get is that the perceptions drive the emotions. So when you try to change the emotions, you're re really hacking at the branches of the problem. You're at the surface of the problem instead of the source of the problem, and therefore you can't solve the problem, yeah. which means the drama remains. In fact, there's a study, HR studies that show, uh, Cy Wakeman studies show that the average amount of drama for the average worker in America, get this, two hours and 26 minutes a day of drama, which is all kinds of the dysfunctional thinking and relating that we have at work. So one, more than a quarter, a third, a third of, of our day is drama. That's why seven out of 10 people are looking for a different job. Seven out of 10 people want to think about quitting their jobs every single day. And, and a lot of people are quitting get, their marriages yeah, and the yeah. same kind of thing well, goes and, in the marriage. And, you know, the thing is you're talking about job and marriage. <clears throat> I think that, you know, Sometimes the emotional aspect, it's difficult to create the proper balance and barrier between the work-life balance. Yeah. Oh, that's you true, know, too. You, yeah. you have emotions at work yeah. you that you have home. a difficult time leaving at work, you bring them home. Mm -hmm. You had a bad day at the office, so we're going to have a bad evening around the dinner table. Oh, yes. Or we're having a difficult season at home, oh, and we're going to carry it to work, so my attitude at work isn't what it should be mm -hmm. because I've got a bad perspective about everything else. Mm -hmm. Emotions are not only something that you have to learn how to manage, but there are certain times where you have to learn how to put them in a compartment and leave them in that yeah. arena. Yeah, and that's yeah. where this whole concept of the limits of the mind come into play and are very powerful. Remember I told you about the bingo ball tumbler. That's everything yeah. in our head, but only one thing, one ball at a time can go through the thought slot. So we're talking about the conscious mind can only think one thought at a time. time. So if we're replacing one thought with something else, then we can lock onto the constructive and block out the destructive, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of ways for us to manage the way we see, which manages the way we feel. feel. And if we have highly constructive perceptions, we are going to have highly constructive emotions. That's just the way it is. Now, when I say constructive, keep in mind, I'm making a difference between what oftentimes people think positive emotions are good, negative emotions are bad. Could not be further from the truth. There is constructive and destructive use of all the emotions. There's a constructive love. There's a destructive love. There's a constructive happiness. Everybody thinks it's always constructive, but there's a destructive, destructive. happiness. Yeah. If I'm feeling like I need to leave my marriage, which, is, which could work, because I'm unhappy, and that unhappiness is not related to something horrible. Correct. That's a destructive happiness. If yeah. I think the grass is greener on the other side with another relationship, and I go want to have that relationship because that'll make me feel happy, that's a destructive happiness. Yeah. In the same way, there's constructive and destructive anger. Anger is not all destructive. There's Correct. some, we should be angry should about be certain angry, things. Yeah. Same with fear. There's constructive fear. Mm -hmm. If there's real danger, if yeah. you're on the edge of the cliff and you're going to yeah, fall off I and die, you, if you're not afraid, something is wrong with you. I recently mm -hmm. watched that, that uh, show, the guy free soloing um, El Capitan. I don't even know, but free soloing. <laughs> this guy climbs 3,500 3, feet up straight granite wall without ropes. Oh. That guy doesn't have the right kind of fear. Yeah. Right? He, he's and obviously the, forgotten like that about die. the reality of gravity. Yeah. The rea I'm, I'm just saying it's, a, it's an amazing story, but yeah. my point <laughs> is there's, he's actually kind of missing Correct. a constructive fear. He's, he's fearless, but not in a way that I think is going to help him live long. Yeah, well, and, and for so many people, it's understanding where those emotions come from and how mm -hmm. to balance them that mm -hmm. enables them to success, successfully navigate the life that they're living. When Absolutely. we come back, we're going to talk about how you can manage your emotions and the impact that they have not only on your life, but the lives of others. You don't want to miss what's coming up next. You're watching The Difference. When we come back... We all live in a climate of inadequate social feedback, which means if your flies unzip, nine out of 10 people are gonna leave it unzipped. They are not gonna tell you. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. God chose Israel as a light unto all nations so that through them, the world might come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. For your gift this month, Hagee Ministries would like to send you resources that will bless your life. Our God is faithful and he has promised to bless those who bless the nation of Israel. Send your gift today. Call the number on your screen or visit jhm.org slash chosen. We're back with Eric talking about emotional intelligence and talking about emotional intelligence, how do I not sound so critical when I'm correcting like my kids or even my husband? Well, it, it, you know, one of the things that, that 
Kendall and I often talk about is compliment before, before you, you criticize. criticize. And, yeah, and, and, and like yet in, in the work that you've written on automatic influence, you talk about, you know, pushing versus pulling, pulling. And, and, and how people, you know, they're pushing for you. And, and sometimes you feel like they're pushing against you. Yes. And, and how does emotional intelligence help that balance. kind of balance between am I being criticized or is this something that's going to make me better? Yeah, I think it, we, we sure. talk about this idea of seeing uh, ourselves pushing for people. We kind of use this illustration of, you know, imagine, uh, imagine, you know, we're, we're pushing this table together, mm -hmm. right? And I say, okay, you push, and I put my hand over yours, and, we, and we're pushing this table. And we do this in the illustration of leadership. There's not going to be much resistance, resistance. on the pat part yeah. of the person because I, they feel like we're pushing together, as opposed to put up your hand, and then let me put my hand against it. And I'm pushing, what are you doing? Pushing back. It's human nature to resist coercion. That's just the bottom line. We are supposed to be free. We're supposed to be powerful. And when people violate that, I think in many senses, they're violating a sacred right. So there's appropriate places to push, and then there's appropriate places to leave people be. And, you know, mind your own business is actually right straight from the Bible. That's mm -hmm. very, very helpful information. <laughs> but there are times where we need, do need to correct people. If that person truly believes that I am pushing for them, not pushing for what's good for me, mm. but pushing for what's good for them, and they truly believe that, then they will receive critique, even when it's forceful, as in a validating way. Mm. Think of a great coach, right? Correct. A great coach pushes his people. I mean, pushes, pushes, pushes. And yet the players do not resent it because he knows he's pushed, they're being pushed to win. Mm. So the issue is, or do my children or do the people I work with that need some input from me know that I'm pushing for them? Do I truly have their best interests at heart? Most of the time, that's where I got to correct myself. I got to check myself because I'm actually thinking of my own interest. What's good for me, me. not what's good for you. Whenever I'm actually uh, counseling like a couple or a family, if that family or that couple's goal is to get better together, then we always know, even in the critique, let's say some, I've got a serious problem in an area. If my wife is talking to me about that problem, I know because we've already had the conversation, she wants me to be a better man. Yeah. So I'm gonna receive that in a different way. And, and you know, part of it's on the receiver too. I can be trained to see even bad feedback as making me better. Because I can always clarify whether it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's usually right. Um, you know, the people that are giving you the bad feedback are the only ones bold enough to say anything. Everyone else yeah. is too kind. They don't want to hurt your feeling. I mean, I, I remember it, there's this concept called inadequate social feedback. Because we don't want to get into an embarrassing situation, we don't want to hurt people's feelings, yeah. and we don't want to create drama. Because we've said stuff, it blew up, we all know what we that's know, like. I'm not going there that. again. There is, we all live in a climate of inadequate social feedback, which means if your fly's unzipped, nine out of 10 people are gonna, gonna leave it unzipped. You. They are not gonna <laughs> tell you. So oh there's all these circumstances in life where it's like, man, I wish someone would Babe, tell you this. I tell would me. tell you, I'd be that oh, one. Yeah, of course you would, because she yeah. wants you to be a better man, but yeah. I wouldn't. Well, she'd probably put I'm it on the church yourself. billboard. His fly is down. <laughs> so I'm writing about this concept of inadequate social feedback on a, on a plane. I'm on a plane, and as God is my witness, right across the aisle, this guy drapes in with a foot and a half long piece of toilet paper attached to his heel, oh. sits right next to me, I'm like, it's gonna fall off eventually. <laughs> so by po here's the point. We people aren't gonna say stuff yeah. because they don't oh, want to. Oh, I would have helped drama. them and just pulled it off real quick. Oh, well, yeah. right, but nobody else would. So you're very yeah. good at this. But you know, most people don't want, like I said, they don't want embarrassing situations. Yeah. They don't want to hurt people's feelings. They don't want drama. And all you gotta do is try that a couple times. Yeah. It's well, like all you gotta do is yeah. stick your finger in the light socket and, once and you're done. You don't want to do that well, anymore. It, for Kendall, because her professional career was as a nurse. She always saw people in a fragile state that she had to address the broken things so that they could get better. Mm. So she has no problem looking at, hey, that's out of place. Let me help you with that. Yes. Because it's just part of her professional background and training right. as where everybody else is like, well, maybe they want it that way. And yeah, maybe you're I the should, one yeah. out of 10. Yeah. Nine and, out and, of 10, and, like, woo, I'm yeah, out of here. And, and one of the greatest frustrations for me is when somebody comes into the equation after the fact and says, I could have told you. You know, where you know. Okay, I just read a book by Patty McCord. She's HR, former HR director of Netflix. So very, very powerful, effective people person solving <laughs> people problems. She had this, and I quote: "If you tell me 
that you saw a problem and you could have told someone about it before and it actually happened, I'm going to run you over in the parking lot because <laughs> you did not help the organization. <laughs> so it, there's this strong culture. By the way, Netflix is fabulous for telling the truth. Netflix uh -huh. people go to other companies and create lots of chaos because they tell the truth to senior yeah. executives. Like, who does this guy think he is? Oh, he's a next Netflix employee. Yeah. They always told the truth. They evaluated each other, and their organization has flourished in terms of feedback because they, they had overcame a common that. goal. They had to overcome oh, that natural yeah. tendency to just stay yeah, back and not say anything. Correct. And, 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 you know, the Proverbs speaks to this issue, and, and we often quote the verse, but we seldom like to engage in the practice. Iron sharpening, sharpening iron. iron. Mm. You know, the, the, awesome. the way that iron sharpens iron is two pieces of iron go against each other's grain. Mm -hmm. They don't work, work in, you know, same direction because if you take a knife and you rub it against a rod in the same direction, you dull the blade. Right. It's only when you take it and you rub it against the grain. So it's the difference between your perspective and my perspective, my perspective. your feelings and my feelings. Right. That's how we get better because exactly. we're, we're, we're rubbing against each other's grain and, and we live in a society that has said, don't do that because you're going right. to disrupt the system. Yeah, so I would call that constructive conflict, yeah. right? So these two things working against each other, against, quote unquote, aren't really working against. Yes. Yeah. They're working for. That's why everybody's sharpening their knives that way. Yeah. And when I can see my wife and I getting sharper together, yeah. or you and I getting sharper together, then I'm willing to say things that other people who want to be polite say. won't say. The truth is the people that are polite are polite, but the truth is they're, they're hurting us in the long run. That's yeah. why Patty McCord wanted to run them over, because <laughs> they're hurting us But she probably in drove like an e-car e that was real light. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was one of those yeah. smart cars that are about big as a toaster. Yeah, Bing, it, yeah. you know, so I get that. <laughs> but the truth is it was hurtful. It yeah. was harmful to not say something. Correct. So I want my wife to be able to say something. Help yeah. me out. Well, and, and, and vice versa. And, and do it in a manner that, again, you're working towards a common goal, which is the good of one another. Yes. You know, this takes us into the conversation of leading and loving. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back in our next segment and discuss that because people often think that leadership requires power, but mm -hmm. the truth is, is leadership requires enough love for the other person to take them in the right direction. We're going to be talking about more on that subject with Eric Van Alstyne when we come back. When we come back... When we love people more, we can actually push harder. But when we don't love people, more pushing, more power means more resistance. See the Bible come to life by standing in the very places where the stories of the Holy Scriptures unfolded. Join pastors John and Matt Hagee on this extraordinary tour of the Holy Land. Visit historical sites such as the Mount of Beatitudes, where Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount, float upon the waters of the Dead Sea, and pray at the Western Wall. Join us November 6th through the 16th, 2023. For more information, call the number on screen or go to jhm.org. Welcome back to The Difference. Eric, we have been talking about emotional intelligence and one of the greatest emotions, the Bible even says it, the greatest of these is love. Mm. And a lot of times people uh, feel like loving and leading are working contrary to one another. But you have a perspective on that, that that's very different. How does love and leadership work together? Well, we have a, actually, we do a teaching on leading with love and power, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that you, you could call it love versus truth, love mm -hmm. versus leadership, love versus power. But the idea is that if you're loving, you're probably not going to be powerful. Yes. And if you're powerful, you're not going to be it's loving. Thing. And it's hard to mm -hmm. see those two working together because they seem to work against each other. Isn't loving meaning that I'm gracious and forgiving and, you know, I let people step on me and I, I mean, Jesus yeah. said, turn the other cheek, right? So yeah. there's this, all this, this question about where do you give and where do you not? And so they typically tend to think, you know, love is weak and power is strong or leadership must be strong and love is weak. Uh, truth must be strong, love is weak. But that's not, that's not really the case at all because when we love people and, we're, and by, by loving is, I'm saying that we're seeing people as people of equal value needs itself. Mm -hmm. We're seeing good, good, we're pushing for them, right? So when we love people more, we can actually push harder. But when we don't love people, more pushing, more power means more resistance, resistance. Mm -hmm. because they're going to push back. And as they, sh as they, 
you know, I don't want to say as they should, but, you know, it's the human nature to be free to, from coercion. Um, so love and leadership should be in their strongest places together. And when leadership lacks love, what happens is strong leaders typically don't get buy-in. They get a lot of passive resistance. It's like, yeah, you're making me do this now. You're making me sit down, but I'm standing up inside for yeah. sure. And right. I'm going to do everything I can to subtly oppose you for the rest of time, just on the principle of justice. Because yeah. you mess with me, I'm going to mess you back. So that's what typically happens in organizational settings. A lot of resentment builds up, a lot of what I call mm. passive resistance. Mm -hmm. You don't see them resisting you. It's not aggressive, active resistance, it's but they're passive. doing it. Yeah, just I, I call it doing the right thing in the wrong way. Yeah, or just, yeah. you know, Oh, yeah, like I'll do that, but it. I'm going to do it with a... <laughs> Bad attitude, yeah. Or they're gonna, you know, they're gonna undermine you. So you'll say Correct. yes to you to your face, but behind your back, woo. Well, in preparation for this conversation, we had some folks that we asked some questions about love and leadership and how it relates to the workplace. Let's take a look at this man on the street video. Eric, why do I feel fearful of giving my opinion when knowing that people will not agree? Eric. How do I control the drama in my workplace? This is crazy. Hey, Eric, how do I deal with like difficult people in my life, you know, around me, like like this person? <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I'm jo okay, so Here we go. three go. very simple questions that yes. I think a lot of people ask, but sometimes those answers aren't necessarily as, as easy as they sound. Yeah, yeah, we're peeling back the onion here, and we're only going to get one layer in, so yeah. I think what we're going to do is we're going to give some more input, right? Correct. We, okay. What I would love for you to do is, is take the time to answer those questions, and we'll put that as a link on our Facebook page, and if you want to see what Eric has to say about those issues then you can go and read that article on the Matt and Kendall Facebook page, and it'll take you not only there, but it'll give you opportunity to engage with ericvanallstein.com and find out more about automatic influence and how it can be an impact in your life. But to me, one of the great statements that we heard there was, I'm fearful to share my opinion, opinion. Mm -hmm. when I know. Yes. They're not going to agree. You know, the, the first half of it was a question. Yes. Should I or should I not share my opinion? But yeah. the last half of it was with certainty. Yeah, I, I know they're not going to like what I have to say. Yes. How often do we find people create those kinds of arguments in their mind? They, they're yeah. already certain of the outcome, even right. without giving people the chance to disappoint them. Yeah, I think it'd be it, it's okay to to question and then find out if they really want to disagree because they may agree, right? But you know, you kind of get that sense though. You know, you're going to go there. And you've been there before, and you know what happens. It's almost mm -hmm. like, you know, trying to unpack a landmine. Yeah. You know, you're, you're digging yeah. in the dirt, and you know how that goes. Eventually, yeah. you dig yeah. in there enough. You're, everything's going to blow up. You poison gas hissing everywhere. Yeah. That's the way it goes. So I think she's talking about being fearful, and I go back to constructive fear and destructive fear. She might be fearful because there is danger. Yeah. So that's a constructive, constructive. useful fear. It's why people don't say anything, because they know where this goes. But I do think there's a sense of, you know, you can be confident in your own opinion. But then on top of that, maybe you can ask for others' opinions first and listen first. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you seek to understand and work through, you might find that there's a lot more opportunity for the opinion to, to, to work. So yeah. I think she's run into challenges in the past. She's got good reasons to be afraid, maybe some bad reasons to be afraid. That's why we're going to have to write, do a little more write-up on it. Yeah, well, I'm so thankful that you're going to take the time to do that. One of the things that I think we should all remember is what John chapter 15 says. Mm. Jesus Christ shared it several times, and he said, This is my commandment. Love one another. Yes. Abide in my love. Love one another as I have loved you. And then he gets to actually one point in the chapter. He says, I've commanded these things to you that your joy may be full. Mm. And I believe that whenever we learn how to listen, love, and lead in that love, which is the way Jesus treated us, mm -hmm. we do have a joyful and fulfilling experience in our relationships that a lot of people are lacking because so true. rather than perfect love, they have a great fear. Yes. And the Bible tells us in another chapter, perfect love casts out That's all right. fear. Yep. So that would be the useless fear, right?
Absolutely. That was, you know, the, this useful versus useless fear was revolutionary for me because you even look at scripture, fear of the Lord. There's times to be afraid. Fools go where angels fear to tread, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's times where fear is the thing that's wise and it's helping you avoid real danger. But then there's these other times where you should be, af uh, you should be afraid, you should be confident, and you yeah. aren't. So, like, for example, this whole idea of I, I'm afraid what someone else might think of me. I have zero fears fear. of that. Zero. I can it, testify. It, it, yeah, yeah, it creates problems. It. it creates problems, <laughs> but it's also very liberating because yeah. I know that who I am is not subject to what someone else that thinks. Mm -hmm. It's like someone saying, you know, Mount Rainier is not a mountain. Well, that, their opinion doesn't alter the fact. It is yeah. what it is. So I am what I am, regardless of people's opinions. So I can be free from fearing what people, people think, think about me yeah. as, a, as it relates to my identity. But then there's other things where, you know, fear is useful. Mm -hmm. I just find it's very, very helpful to start thinking about fear in terms of two dimensions instead of just one. Yeah. So, so very powerful. We've just touched on one of the multitude of topics that's in the content of the work that you do. Uh, you do it for corporations. You do it in a, not, a lot of organizations. You've helped our ministry and our team here. Mm -hmm. If individuals who are watching want to find out how they can engage more deeply with the content, where should they go? Yeah, go to ericvanalstein.com. All the information's there, and uh, we go through, you know, we talk about how do I deal with drama at work. We have answers for that. Yeah. It yeah. is fabulous. We've seen major transformation. So it's just exciting to be able to know that we're helping people. I mean, we're having some of the, the executives at the biggest companies in the world say, you know, I've been in this for a long time. I've seen a lot of leadership stuff. This is moving the needle like nothing I've ever seen. So it's really awesome to be able to help people, to be able to do that. One of the places where we engage in demonstrating the love of God, casting out fear, and helping others make a difference is the Sanctuary of Hope. We would love for you to watch this and find out more about it. The life of a child is precious in God's eyes, and the gift of life is something you can become a part of today. We at Hagee Ministries are offering you the opportunity to change the life of a child and mother by becoming a legacy partner. As a legacy partner, your monthly gift supports the Sanctuary of Hope that is a one-of-a-kind safe haven that provides a home to single expectant mothers and offers resources that will enable them to find success in their communities. The Sanctuary of Hope exists to provide a loving, safe environment where both baby and mother can receive the education, care, and hope they so desperately need. When you partner with us, our legacy becomes your legacy, and together we are impacting lives and transforming nations for Jesus Christ. There has never been a better time to share the love of Christ with a mother and a child than right now. Become a legacy partner today. Call the number on the screen or go to jhm.org slash partner. I actually attended Cornerstone Christian Schools all my life uh, since K-4. I've received so much experience of uh, worship, volunteering. Um, I've, I've really grown in this church I think what Pastor Matt and Ms. Kendall are doing with Cornerstone is, is so amazing. They really are changing so many people's lives, not just in San Antonio, but around the world. They're really fulfilling their mission statement um, to all the gospel, to all the world and generations. I think it's amazing. For more information on Eric's insight and his answers, I want to remind you that you can go to the Matt and Kendall Hagee Facebook page and also to ericvanallstein.com. You know, drama is inevitable, but that doesn't mean that it's not avoidable. You can avoid it in your life when you choose how to respond. And if you respond in love instead of fear, I assure you, you're going to overcome most situations with a better outcome than you could even imagine. Thank you for joining us today on The Difference. We pray that this content was a blessing to you. Kendall and I look forward to seeing you again very soon.